Okay, yep. perfect. So I just want to acknowledge uh, Morgan's efforts last week because she inspired me to use the same packages for the slides and I've never used it before. So thanks for that. Um, uh, this is Zarin again. I, I don't know how to say that, but. And I tried the flip book too. Um, I'm not really like utilizing all of its functions, but it was nice to have a side-by-side -side thing that you'll um, probably see later on. So um, this walkthrough is walkthrough three, as you know, uh, using school level aggregate data to illuminate um, educational inequities. So some of the topics emphasized are importing, tidying, transforming and visualizing data. And the functions um, that we're going to use in this are uh, mutate at from the deployer package, read RDS, the map functions um, from the per package, as well as set names from that package, and uh, slice. And so some vocabulary in case um, people might not be familiar with, um, aggregated and disaggregated data is the focus of this chapter. We're going to be looking at data frames, um, a specific metric of free and reduced price lunch, uh, histograms, lists, subgroups, trending, and weighted averages. So just as an overview, this is pulling from a lot of the language in the chapter, so feel free. I, I kind of streamlined it, but if there's anything missing that you guys um, saw in the chapter, let me know. We can discuss as well. But um, the main overview is to explore what aggregated data is um, and how to access, clean, and explore it. So aggregated data refers to data, either numerical or non-numerical, that could have the following characteristics. It can be collected from multiple sources um, and or on multiple measures, variables, and individuals. And it's usually compiled into some kind of data summary for summary reports, and it's typically used for public reporting, either at the state or federal levels, um, or for statistical analysis. Um, so what we're going to do in this walkthrough is focus on educational equity. Um, by identifying and comparing patterns in specific student demographic groups. So this is a toy example just to kind of illustrate what aggregated um, data is and how that differs from student level data. So if we create some kind of um, fake data, this is a table showing one row per student. So it's individual student level data. And you can see at the school level, um, we have two different um, students in each school. So it's kind of, um, you can see like two Ks, two Ls, two Ms. So when we aggregate this data, it's basically what we're grouping by the school, right? So we're getting a mean score. Um, if we're looking at that score as a metric, the test score is hiding the student level information um, by grouping by school. So you kind of lose some information about individual students here. And one way of doing, of using aggregated data or one reason why is to kind of protect privacy um, of students and which makes it kind of publicly available for use. Okay, so what does it mean to disaggregate aggregated data? So common disaggregations um, include gender, race and ethnicity, um, SES, English learner designations, and whether students are served under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, I'm not, so in my own work, I'm not so familiar with these. We like in the higher ed kind of realm, I do use gender, race, ethnicity, and maybe um, like first generation status, but not. I, I'm not quite familiar with the other ones, but I guess it just depends on what sector of the education um, world you, you work in. But um, disaggregating data with an equity lens um, includes or is essential for monitoring equity and educational resources and outcomes. So um, if we only use aggregated data, it's gonna be difficult to distinguish different groups of students um, and what supports they're gonna need. So um, with disaggregating data, we can identify uh, where solutions are needed to solve disparities in opportunities, resources, and different treatments or interventions. So this one I wanted to open up a little bit about different data, aggregated data that's available publicly. Um, they, these are kind of listed in the chapter on different levels. You have international, some federal um, data sets and some state and district level data sets. And I was wondering if anybody has encountered these before or used them in their work or if there are any other um, ones that you can think of that kind of fit into this category of aggregated data.
I know in Washington, we use, I think it's called OSPI or something like that. It's like the office or office of superintendents, which comes from like high schools of like uh, aggregated, you know, how many students from high school X go to college and like uh, gives a percent of from like five to 10% or something like that. I think, I think states probably have that. And I think we also use, uh, I don't know, I blanked, but the, yeah, we use the high school ones like OSPI, but I think it just depends on per se. Yeah, I've, I've not encountered that one. Of these, actually, I've only used iPads and that's because we report data out, but I don't know if our office really like brings that in. We have other data sets um, for higher ed for benchmarking peer groups and stuff like that, but. Um, I'm with you, Alyssa, I, I know uh, not me personally, but uh, people I work with generate the iPads report going out. Um, but at least so far, I, I'm not aware of reaching out and grabbing it uh, <laughs> and analyzing from there. Yeah, most states, like Edward, Edgar was saying, uh, have those databases for like counts of students. K through 12 or various state assessments that they do and then like you know kindergarten readiness or going to college rates and so I, I'm in Washington as well so I use OSPI and the education research data center the RDC they pulled that data um, and then I also use um, I'm blanking on the name the National Student Clearinghouse so that's a national database um, and that's more like high school to K or to post-secondary, so you guys might be familiar with that. And so they have public data, and then we have clients who want that data um, at the student level, and so they have contracts with them, and then they have all that data based, you know, student to student over over time. So the project I'm working on right now uses the Stanford Educational Data Archive um, or CETA, and uh, the cool thing about that data is that it's like proficiency scores often can't be compared across states um, and it attempts to like uh, make it so that you can. <laughs> and so I'm like still trying to wrap my head around it, <laughs> but um, it's uh, like, since we tend to look at, you know, different states, um, it's, it's a pretty handy data set that, that lets you do that. Okay, so I will move on if, unless anybody wants to chime in, but feel free to interrupt me throughout the presentation as well. Um, okay, so for this particular walkthrough, we're going to look at one school district's data. And um, the key here is that it includes not only like the percentages that you normally see in summary reports, but the number of students as well, which is what's going to be kind of key in some of the calculations. And so um, what we're going to do is walk through how uh, running analyses on data from a single district can help education practi practitioners to understand and describe the landscape of needs. So that's kind of a general overview of what I already said before. But the key here is that it's really descriptive uh, analysis because there's a limitation on aggregated data as to how much you can claim from it. So it's really kind of a way to um, um, see what you can find in terms of patterns, but also to like dig in further in non um, disaggregated data. So these are the packages um, to load. I have a caveat on the bottom of tabulizer because there, there was some language in the chapter um, kind of warning about issues on install and I ran into them um, with our Java, I think. And so I didn't actually use that package to um, kind of import, but that is a way. So I kind of kept it in there um, to import the, the data. So there are three ways you can use tabulizer um, with this extract tables. Um, so you really, what we're trying to do is extract data from a PDF or FT. And so there's that version, there's that way, there's also the GitHub repository and then the data EDU package. So that's the one that I ended up doing that third um, option, but there are other options if you wanna go back to the chapter. Um, okay, so we get the data and we put it into race PDF. That's just kind of, it's raw form. And um, this is a lot of text here, but this is really the processing stage of getting it into um, the right data frame structure that we want. 
So um, it's first making it into a tibble and then making using the map df function to make it into a data frame. So those are the two kind of functions that were in the beginning of the chapters and it's kind of highlighted. And the slice function um, I have not used before, but it makes sense when it's doing it, um, removing unnecessary, unnecessary rows. And then lastly, it's just giving descriptive names for the columns. So I don't know if this is all familiar with everybody, if people have used these functions before. Yeah. Once we do that, it's still not quite in the structure that we want. So this is a lot of kind of text on the, on the screen, but I wanted to show a few rows to illustrate what kind of cleaning we need to do. Um, so the output of that code was like all of this data, which are all, you can see, are characters. Um, there are also some blanks and some two rows with the kind of total in the description. So I just kind of lay that out to kind of explain what it's doing in the code. So first um, we want to remove unnecessary columns. So someone like school group, we don't really care about grades. Um, some of these columns that are down here that are not actually described. Um, and then we want to remove grand total rows because this is kind of like that, um, I guess like all the data grand total, right? But we want to keep the, the total of the school in there. So what it's doing here is basically selecting it based on having total in the name but filtering out the grand totals. And clean, we clean up the school names, adding by kind of replacing it with the white space and trimming that white space. And then we want to clean up these percentages because it actually has like the character percent on there, but we want to actually do math on the numbers. So we remove the um, percents and make it into, oops, oh my God, sorry. Um, yeah, as a numeric, and then we do it over 100 for the numbers. So that is kind of like getting us into um, the structure that we want to analyze. And then there's another set of data here that we're using, which is that free uh, reduced price lunch um, data. So this is a proxy for, um, I guess, poverty level for high school, um, which is set in the chapter as being also controversial as a, as a accurate measure. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to speak to that or if there are alternative metrics that are used um, now or, or um, but in this particular walkthrough, that's what we're using. So we import that data similar to the race data. We kind of do the same kind of process into making it to, from a tibble to a data frame and then setting descriptive um, column names. And this also is not quite there yet. So we have some blank numbers here and we have some aggregated lines that kind of seem to be sums um, from K through eighth grade. So we wanna get rid of those. Um, so this is really just removing particular rows that we don't want in our final data set. And again, we're cleaning up these percents the way that we did before. And then our final step here is just to join the two. So we're doing a left join with the race data frame and the free re reduced price lunch data frame uh, linking on school name. And it makes a note, it doesn't quite explain the reason why, but it says that the total number of students are, don't quite match in the two data frames. And that's kind of like a executive judgment or, or whoever's familiar with the data set would have to kind of um, make that decision as to what, what the truth is. Um, this is a left join, so I'm guessing we're keeping the race numbers as the, the truth. But um, it kind of opened the question as to why student numbers might be different. Um, I think in my work, we have different times of counting students, at least in the term in, in higher ed, we have like a snapshot for a term versus the end of term number in case people withdraw from courses. I'm not quite sure how it works with K through 12, but. I can imagine situations where the numbers would change um, and, and saying like different data sets snapped at different times or something. But that was just kind of like an open question that was posed. 
Okay, so this is um, some more steps. <laughs> this is a lot of text, but we want to look at high poverty schools. So in order to do that, um, we use this definition from the NECS um, for schools that are over 75% for free reduced price lunch. Um, so we're counting the number of students for particular races um, that meet that criteria, if that makes sense. And then we're gonna use the function adorn totals to sum the columns um, to create that weighted average that we want. So um, the average, the weighted average is the percentage of each race dividing by the number of students by rate, uh, the number of students by race by the total number of students. And then um, to get the free reduced price lunch percentage for all schools, we recalculate that percentage as a weighted average. Okay, so that's what it's doing in this code. Um, I don't know if you, we should go through it, but this is the 75% threshold that we set. Um, this is where you're summing the columns and creating that percentage by demographic and then the high poverty kind of distinction is, is um, creating the, the percentage here by demographic and poverty level. Um, lastly, we tidy it up using pivot longer. I think we I think we saw that last week or a couple weeks ago. Um, and then now this is visualization. So in this discovering distributions, what we are looking at is a percentage of the population by subgroup. So the idea here is to kind of set up what is the population overall in the district. And then, um, then we're going to kind of like set our, um, our distributions for how to compare with um, the free reduced price lunch data that we're going to show. So um, this is showing that it is pretty diverse across the district. So 40% of students are black and 36% are white. Um, we have lower percentages for Hispanic, Asians, and Native American students. Um, and just let, let me know if you want to stop for the code or to go through that. Um, and then we're going to look at eligibility for free reduced price lunch. So this is to see the percentage who are eligible and comparing it to like a US average to kind of gauge a baseline. So 56.9% in this data set are eligible for free reduced price lunch, um, which is 52% compared to 52% as average. So um, yeah, this note here is just to kind of make sure that our calculations are matching the original PDF versions of the summary data. And so we can also analyze spread. So what this does is look at um, percentage of white students within schools. So if we see 0% to 100% by percentage, so 35% are actually, um, of schools have between zero and 10% white students. And more than half the schools enroll fewer than 30% of students, even though white students make up 35% of the student population. Um, so I just want to, if there's any questions, let me know. Okay, so basically the take home message is that the school race demographics are not representative of the district population. And so those are just demographics. So now we're going to look at SES status to see if it is also or um, not representative. So um, high poverty schools are defined again as uh, public schools where more than 75% of the students are eligible. So we're using the same um, definition. So according to NCES, 24% of public school students attended high poverty schools. However, different subgroups are overrepresented and underrepresented within high poverty schools. So what we're gonna look at here is um, what are the demographic distributions within high poverty schools? So for this particular data set. So if we look at subgroup distributions in high poverty schools using that 75% threshold um, distinction, 8% um, of white students attend 
high poverty schools. And this is compared to 43% of black students, 39% of Hispanic students, 28% of Asian students, and 45% of Native American students. So non-white students are, not, are disproportionately attending high poverty schools. So if we compare that to what we thought was a diverse kind of district, it's not um, equally distributed across high poverty and low poverty schools in the district. And so in terms of revealing relationships, we can look at free reduced price lunch percentage in a school with kind of the white percentage or the percentage of white students in a school. And you can see like the negative uh, linear relationship where um, a school with high free reduced price lunch percentages have lower white percentage, which is kind of, kind of seen here too. This is just another way of showing that relationship. Okay, so results, there exists a, distribu a distribution of race ethnicity with schools that are not representative of the school district's data, um, particularly school students of color overrepresented in high poverty schools. And that negative relationship that we saw linearly um, between the white students in a school and the percentage of students eligible for free and reduced price coverage. So this is just a way of showing how disaggregating aggregate data can kind of uh, highlight inequities in a system or um, kind of point to ways to improve the situation in a district. So um, research has shown that racial and social economic diversity in schools can provide students with a range of cognitive and social benefits. So there's the benefit aspect. Um, so deep segregation um, can have adverse effects on students. And on the flip side, like high poverty schools may act, may that may be an indication of lacking other educational resources that other schools don't have um, or that doesn't exist in low poverty schools. So these are just kind of reasons why it matters, right? And what, why interventions and, and changes should be um, implemented when you see patterns like this in school districts data. And that is it, I went very fast. If, are there any questions or is this something that you guys already do in your work, um, disaggregating? I know we talked a little bit about using some data sets, but um, is this like a focus on about looking at different student subpopulations, either demographically or? Um, I work with the, <clears throat> I work on a project with the Seattle School District. Um, it's like, I think this is year six or seven and I came on like two years in, but they were looking at, um, well, they the knew in the district that there was a, just inequities in art education throughout like the schools. And like, I don't know what you guys know about the Seattle School District, but it's a, one of the bigger ones in the country, not the biggest, but it's like very wide and sprawling in their different neighborhoods. Some are more white and Asian affluent and then other ones are just definitely not. And so um, have like higher food and spice, price lunch um, and students of color and so they found inequities. They knew that they were there, but we were measuring how bad they were. And so we basically made, for each school in the district, we made a set of uh, equity charts for each type of uh, different like art class. So like for music, visual arts, I think it was media arts, and then one other like performing arts. And so we just, it was all under the assumption that whatever percentage of a group of the ethnicity is at a school. So let's say a school is 30% white and that same ish percentage should be in representing those classes. And throughout the district, it would turn out that like band was almost all white and Asian students, even though like even at a school that was like 60% black. Um, it was like, there was one school that's 75% black and Hispanic. And, the, so, and then the 25% is mostly white and Asian, but the band courses were like 85% white and Asian students, so just inequity. So we made those for the whole schools our all schools across the district and then for the past like six years they've been trying to funnel money into the schools that actually have those inequities because um i mean i'm sure we all know growing up like art programs always get cut first when there's budget issues and they've there's you know been budget issues in the last decade everywhere and then the schools that have like strong ptsas or lots of parent involvement and then lots of money that can be raised like that usually ends up supplementing arts 
And so this was a nice way to visualize that based on the schools in the area. And then there's obviously a huge correlation to where those neighborhoods were all over the city. And so there was, they've directed funding. And so now we're showing like over the last seven years that those schools are the ones getting more funding and they've added music teachers like the elementary schools and they've added theater programs and middle schools, just things that you only see in those high white affluent, Asian white affluent neighborhoods that are actually happening in schools all over. And so now we're trying to tackle the problem of like, how do we get the students like, butts in the seats for those actual classes? Um, so like yeah, our firm works, almost every single project we do now is has some equity lens. We do a lot of these representation charts. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah, ours is like, it's kind of difficult to look at higher ed and kind of the surrounding neighborhoods because it's like, by definition, people are coming, especially like in our private university, there's like already a huge, um, it's, a, it's a white dominated student population, I guess. And so um, a lot of our, I guess, equity analyses are kind of about students, also faculty, diversity and also but our numbers like I guess in the general population are pretty low so it's kind of we've been trying to figure out um, a lot of the aggregation aggregated data that we look at too is just like kind of this catch-all underrepresented minority and that changes based on discipline so um, I think for like the nursing school that we have it's includes Asians but our undergrad population doesn't so it, it kind of we're trying to figure out how to define things as well internally and as we report out. So um, that's really like kind of what we do. It's completely different from this kind of analysis. Uh, Ryan and Isabella shared some things about the free and reduced price lunch. Um, oh, okay. Let me, oh, I can't. In the chat and I was curious just to hear Obviously, we read them, but uh, since time permits, um, would you guys tell us a little bit about those initiatives or what the issues are? Uh, sure, yeah. So the, the one that I shared um, from Data Quality Campaign, it's like this little two-pager, two or three pages. Have it up. Yeah, just two pages of um, the brief history of, um, you know, using free and reduced price lunch um, and, you know, where it came from and, and what it was intended to do and still, you know, doing it, what it does, you know, for students is good things, but then using that as a metric of poverty is now becoming a little less accurate because of another policy that was put in place about expanding free and reduced price lunch for um, even more children who um, aren't required to provide um, uh, their economic status or, you know, the poverty status or whatever. Um, and so, you know, kids are being provided for, but now that metric is no longer useful in um, calculating poverty. And so this group, um, uh, uh, data quality campaign um, and others are now trying to figure out new ways into um, better capture poverty um, that is still the aggregate level um, for schools, but also trying to get um, as close to the student as possible um, while respecting, you know, my minors and, and privacy and things like that. So um, they don't have like a specific um, uh, approach yet. Uh, they're, they're, they've suggested some things that other people are doing, um, like running some, um, uh, you know, doing some percentages based off of other, other um, calculations, but um, they're, they're currently in the works of trying to provide a new way of understanding or defining and, and measuring poverty, uh, student poverty. Yeah, exactly that. Um, you know, and, and the way it shows up in some data sets is you download the data set and then for a particular school, the free reduced price lunch percentage is 100%. And that's because every student gets free um, 
uh, free lunch or, or reduced price lunch, but it it doesn't help like in, in terms of like if what you're hoping is to um, uh, look at schools with with uh, students experiencing poverty and how they differ from other schools or things like that. Um, and so the Urban Institute project, I believe what their methodology is, is, um, you know, they're using a combination of census data and available, um, like, trying to, like, cross-reference it with uh, free reduced price lunch data and then also bring that down from, um, you know, the county level that's available in the census down to the school level. And so, um, you know, I, I think, like, it is... Um, you know, hopefully going to be a very useful alternate measure for poverty. Uh, I'm curious to see, like, you know, how much analytic skills would be required to keep this ongoing because it's not, you know, a federally mandated sort of figure to report. Um, and if it's like, if it requires uh, too much like analytic burden to like be able to do, like how useful is it really? But like, um, but it is like one of the attempts to try to, um, to address the fact that free reduced price lunch just uh, doesn't really give the information about about poverty measures as, as one would hope. So will they be able to calculate the new metric retroactively so that you can see continued yeah, trends in it, or will there be like a rupture when when it ceased to work at when the old measure ceased to work? Yeah, I, I think it's like really point in time. One of the things I asked my coworker, I was like, how will we use this next year and the year after that? Um, I think that's still an open question. Um, just judging first to see like how we apply it this year with this year's data and then moving forward. <laughs> Thanks, I didn't know that any of that. Um, another sample I had about uh, this just a disaggregation in the school districts and kind of going off that is here at my community college we have a big running star population and running start itself is disproportionately white and so you know we're a hispanic serving district and you know we have a huge hispanic serving population but the majority of our running star students are white even though they might be coming from you know high schools that aren't predominantly white and so you know kind of showing that you know, there are areas that we can improve on and, you know, equity when it comes to running star and, you know, figuring out what can we offer, you know, potential running star students. Is it because of the distance? Is it because of, you know, family or anything that, you know, um, that we can shed some light on, I think is another, I think running star for us, especially is, is something that we really want to improve on, on the, the equities that come with it. So just out of curiosity, I, I wanted to know what, so you show the white percentage compared to um, free and reduced price lunch, and it's just a clear uh, linear relationship. And so what I want to do is I wanted to show or like see all the races and their relationships. Um, so I did a faceted plot um, of the five races that are in the, um, in the data set and uh, a couple of them are not, uh, they're, they're, uh, so what is AS? I didn't change the names. A, is AS Asian population percentage? Um, yeah, they're, they range, you know, there's, there's not a lot of that, like the percentage of Asian, Asian. um, uh, per population within the schools, um, obviously not a, a ton, um, uh, but then they range from zero to 100% on free and reduced price lunch within the schools. Um, same with uh, is NA Native American. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I should have studied out these <laughs> um, <laughs> things a little bit more, but they're very similar where there's, um, in fact, let me just, can I share my screen? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, can you see that? So here's the, here's the white percentage, right? Clearly, um, there's a relationship between as you know, the more white students are in a school, 
um, you know, free and reduced price launch percentage um, is low. So this African American, right? There's, I think this is the this one and um, Hispanic, you know, are the clearest relationships up the other way. Um, I, I didn't draw a, a, a linear uh, line or you know, line of best fit, but um, it's just it was interesting because I want to see what those other ones are, were doing. Um, because this one was so clear, I just want to see the other ones, but um, interesting. So, yeah, I think it may be because of the the number of students being so low, we don't see it. But yeah, it is kind of all over the whole range. Right, for Asian and, and Native American, yeah. So. We, we referenced the Urban Institute a lot, so apologies. They just came out with an article about, um, you know, <laughs> to like further disaggregate data, basically advocating for that. And I wonder too, because, um, you know, if, if of course, like being able to look at individual student data would perhaps give the most insight, but I just wonder what um, what it would look like, like with other like demographic points or, um, you know, uh, more specific groups of the different demographics too. Um, but, you know, the, the pitfalls of publicly available data is like being able to use what is, <laughs> what is available and, you know, actually analyzable. <laughs> so. Um, do people have experience, you know, when, when certain race ethnicity category is so small, like at the school level in California state data, uh, like if you don't have more than 10 cases, I think it will not be reported like NA. But in any case, uh, so my, my question is, uh, what's the good way to um, merge certain race and ethnicity categories when you need to do you know, increase N in each uh, category? So for example, is it justifiable to merge Asians with Pacific Islanders and um, uh, Alaska natives? And sometimes I was uh, surprised that in California state data, uh, Filipinos are called out as one particular race group and they're separated from Asian category. Um, so I, I wonder, and then also relatedly, Sometimes Hispanic question is like binary initially, right? Like, are you Hispanic or not? And then there is a separate question about um, ethnicity, right? Um, how do you people approach and then try to identify Hispanic race category if you have that two level, you know, two separate questions for that particular group? You know, at least in our in our institution, we do have Hispanic as the ethnicity question, and then race is a separate. Um, so somebody can technically be like white and Hispanic. Um, we also have. Um, I think a lot of actually our data definition, like the categories, are based on like reporting definitions and needs. So like I don't think anybody sat and like said like we need to disagree or like have like like Filipino students or, or like you mentioned um, separately like. I think if we were in that position, it would probably be like what kinds of decisions we can make on these different student populations would make sense. Um, but yeah, I think it's always top down kind of like, oh, we need to report it in this way. So we're just gonna store, store it that way. And I, I don't think anybody's really like reflected and, and, and thought about if that's the right way to do it or not, at least, at least at our, my institution. Yeah, I think we've kind of had that same discussion of like, I'm kind of reassessing is our grouping really appropriate are we you know are we grouping the right people who should be grouping you know obviously you can't with a small size issue is what can you tell from that but then also you don't want to incorrectly group as well mm -hmm. and so we've been you know trying to discuss like I think there's this new term called like BIPOC mm -hmm. I think like black indigenous people of color like okay. do you do that way something we've considered or doing you know we get our data from the state board. So they kind of group it like people of color. Like, but then the question is, do you include, you know, Asians in the people of color? It's, I think just being, I think 
being conscious and being very clear, I think on the way out, there's no, you know, there's no definitive answer, obviously, but I think being clear on how you categorize can really, it, I think is a big move. And so, you know, we've all had that discussion. I think we're trying to figure out what's the best to kind of get, you know, everybody needs different needs, so. I know my institution is kind of unique since um, about 35% of our institution is Native American. Uh, since we're in the heart of Cherokee Nation. Um, so it's interesting for us. I feel like we have the standard, I, I could be wrong, the, the standard, you know, for race, white, Black or African American, Asian, um, American Indian or Alaskan Native, and then separate Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, which is so low, I typically have to add it to another uh, another group because it's just so low. And then two or more and identif unidentified. Um, for us, we actually have separated, we've made our own category separate from that to just say Native American, yes or no. Because a lot of our students report that they're in the two or more category. And um, that doesn't really matter. <laughs> Like it doesn't matter if they're, they're Native American and something else. Um, what's important to our institution and, uh, you know, the Cherokee Nation, uh, <laughs> you know, is a, is a big, is a big one. And, you know, all, all of this other, you know, tribal financial aid, right, is, Native American, yes or no. And so we've had to create like this third box, right? We, you have the ethnicity, you have race, and then we have to have this third custom Native American, yes or no, because so many of our students select two or more when that's not really the information we needed. It's a really tough one. We go like as granular as possible and then like, but you know, sometimes it has to be um, like a big generic bucket just to make the cell sizes something that can actually be reported. It's tough. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying to look up how the census does it, but it's also not very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, they have the, the categories that we've all talked about, but then like, and obviously they have a lot more numbers than we would ever have unless we end up working for the census. But um, yeah, even, even they don't really, they just talk about like it's was mandated at this year. And so we're gonna also collect, you know, Hispanic um, origin as well as, you know, um, race. Um, Are there any other questions or other topics related that might have come up in your work? Not really related, but I was curious, did you start with the, uh, with the whatever, flip bar or cigar in template, or did you, you start with what I did last week? <laughs> I started with yours actually and oh, then cool. like okay I don't know quite what it's doing so I like then I looked into the documentation to tweak it um when I wanted the slides to like uh different or to like reduce the font size because like the code was like huge. oh yeah like oh it's cutting off and I couldn't um at least for some of the ones that like the the plotting ones that have like so many lines and I'm like I can't re remove the comments without removing some context so I had to like make the font size like 75 percent or something or, um, so yeah, it, it just I tweaked yours basically. So thanks. Awesome. For <laughs>